Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to speak to you about this new novel, which uh, was published on the 30th of October. Uh, it's the first part of a series of novels. I, I describe myself as being long-winded, and I also like, as a general rule, to be fair to my characters, all of them, and also to be very respectful, usually respectful and very supportive and protective of the, the young and the weak, and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think I remember whether I will, I'm supposed to read for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Or should we try the 10 minutes and then ask questions? And, is that Does that make sense? Yes, yes because uh, um, question and answers are more fun than, than reading. Well, this, is, this has been described as a new departure for me in that uh, the majority, almost everything that I have written, I have written many novels, some of which have never been published, and I have no idea where they are. But I've also written plays and many, many essays, and they're all set in Somalia, except for this novel. Uh, I could explain one of the reasons why, but we won't go into it at the moment. So let me just read a bit. In a dream just before dawn, Ar, the main character of the novel, before Bella comes on, Ar keeps trying to corral a dozen ground squirrels into his apartment. Time and again, he fails miserably. In spite of this, he doesn't give up. And eventually, he runs up quite a few of them. But just as he attempts to shut the door on the last of the rot, he observes in the hallway the presence of a familiar figure, Valerie, whom he thinks of as his former wife, although they have never actually divorced. But what on earth is she doing here? And why are the grand squirrels gathering around her having come out of the room? looking eagerly up at her as if she might offer them treats. Indeed, Valerie is wearing an apron with huge pockets, from which she begins extracting seeds, nuts, dead insects, and other tidbits that she feeds to the rodents. Enraged, he speaks a few choice expellatives under his breath. Then he resumes his efforts to rally those nearest him, but he feels he has a chance in hell to lure away the ones that are happily feeding around Valerie. He doubts if he will succeed in doing what he has set out to do. Ar has not set eyes on Valerie since she disappeared from his life and that of their children a decade ago. Why would she make this sudden reappearance here in Mogadishu, where he is living for only a very short while, or rather in his dream there? And come to think of it, what have <coughs> grand squirrels to do with her, or with either of them for that matter, 
He watches in bemusement as some of the creatures, having eaten their fill, pirouette for the others, who applaud as squirrels do, rising on their hind legs and touching their palms together. But why is Valerie back in his life at just the point when he no longer misses her? Our heart expands with great sorrow, yet he won't admit defeat. He triples his endeavor to pen in as many squirrels as he can, singling out the satisfied ones who surrender more easily to his will. But when no more snacks are forthcoming from Valerie, the squirrels look confused and some manage to give him the slip again when others come and go entering the room at his behest or departing again at Valerie's insistence. In the ensuing chaos, with neither Valerie nor R willing to back down, frenzy sets in, and the poor things begin pushing and shoving one another, looking helpless and lost. Just then, R feels the quiet presence of someone else on the periphery of his vision. A woman, elegantly dressed all in black, is placing a tripod within shooting distance and mounting a compact digital camera on it. Busy attending to the squirrels, Valerie doesn't take doesn't take any notice of her, but R recognizes Bella, his sister, and he wonders how come she did not bother to email or phone to alert him of her eminent arrival. How bizarre, and how unlike her. They had last seen each other in Istanbul, where when he was on his way to his current posting in Mogadishu, Somalia. Bella had flown in from Brazil, where she had spent nearly a week together. But here she is in her birth city, where she hasn't set foot in since 1991. <coughs> When the two of them fled the fight in Mogadishu with their mother, first to Nairobi and then eventually to Rome. Silent, he watches Bella as she approaches and adjusts the position of the camera. Her shadow lengthening, her feet widening in a knowing grin as her eyes encounter ours. He's now relaxed, no longer worried. Bella, more than anyone else, gives him comfort. And Bella, more than anyone else, discomforts Valerie. Because if there is anything Valerie hates, it's having her pictures taken when she's not ready for them. And lo and behold, the minute Valerie's eyes fix on Bella's camera and its attendant, Paraphernalia, she begins to make ponderous and gainly movements. Hardly has another moment passed before she beats the undignified retreat of a vanquished rival, slinking away without so much as a word of self justification or apology. And then R uh, manages to herd all the squirrels <coughs> into his apartment. Thank you very much. <laughs> now what I'm going to do is to place, place this character called R uh, in the context of the novel. And the reason is because he R uh, spelled as 
a, 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 which in Somali actually means revenge or vengeance, and is murdered by terrorists in Mogadishu. I do not know whether those of you are interested in the stories in the world news have heard of a time last year when about 15 United Nations personnel were killed in Mogadish through a terrorist <coughs> bomb. Now, the, I had based the novel on a character not at all related to me, a character I did not know, had nothing to do with it. I wasn't in Mogadish at the time. And then, tragically, what happened after I finished the first draft of the novel, exactly the same thing happened to my own sister, who worked for UNICEF in Kabul, Afghanistan. So you can imagine how much guilt I felt, as if I had foretold my sister's death. And it's been quite difficult at times, and the reason is because I did consider whether or not to rewrite it, to create, you know, that artistic difference, distance between the character whom I created and my sister, who died in a similar way, not always exactly in the same way, but in a, in a similar way. Anyhow, so this particular person called R dies, and then his children, because he lives, his children, <coughs> in Somalia you can't actually have a very decent life, because, you know, the terrorists born almost everything quite frequently, and you can't have a decent life, decent existence, you can't go to school, you can't do much else. And so what happened, what happens to his children, because his wife, or former wife, whatever you want to call it, Valerie, who is English, uh, disappeared without explanation. And so he lives, he's a single parent, commutes quite often between Mogadishu and Nairobi, which is safer. And once he is dead, the consequence of his death bring together very many other parties. And of these parties, we know Valerie, who is the mother of the children, the biological mother of the children, who disappeared. And Bella, his sister, who is a professional photographer, fashion photographer, and you know who leads a very uh, active life. He has three lovers. One because one because he's very intelligent. Another one because he's good in bed. And a third one is a philosopher of some sort. And therefore, she is juggling between these when she hears the death. She hears the death of her brother, and then she goes to Nairobi. Now, the relationship between Kenya and Somalia is comparable in a way to the relationship between Mexico and the US. I don't need to go any further than that because you know, you know what you think about Mexicans, we know what. The Kenyans think about uh, Somalis because Somalia has been producing a great number of refugees because of the conflict that has been going on for close to 23 years. Would you like me to give you more reading or shall we start talking about the book and about other things? I like democracy to <laughs> At every possible occasion. Talking. 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 
two men have spoken. <laughs> right, we will talk. And then if we run out of talking, I will read something. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. If I may, thank you. Yes. Thank you for being here. Um, as a teacher of literature, can you comment a bit on the use of the novelistic technique, which I noticed in your book, uh, opening with a prologue and then with dialogue in the first chapter? I don't quite understand the question. Right. I, I noticed you opened with a prologue. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then the first chapter begins with dialogue. Uh huh. So, as, as a teacher, can you tell us something about that novelistic technique? Is it is there a reason why you have a prologue rather than beginning with chapter one? Or? Well, it is actually there is a reason quite often, and one of the reasons is that uh, you know when you go to a restaurant. And a very good one. <laughs> they usually give you excellent bread and tidbits that you can eat. And you can tell from the kind of bread they serve you how good they are. And even at an Indian restaurant, you can tell how good the papadam is. From how good or bad the papadam is, you can tell whether the good is the food is good or not. So that's one. And quite often, what you're given when you first sit down is seldom the same as what you would expect later. Do you see? Mm. So the, the, uh, the prologue suggests the direction in which the story is going to move. And then you're introduced to some of the events and some of the characters that will appear in the novel. For example, in a dream situation now, you have uh, Ar meeting his estranged wife, Valerie, and his sister. Nothing is happening between them. They haven't spoken anything. And yet you're given tidbits, you know, like the aperitif. You, you're being teased. Squirrels are part of the tease, and then you listen to it, and then after this particular scene, the in inverted commas proper story where things happen begin. <coughs> and in that same way, you go through different stages of the narrative, and you are introduced properly, but not immediately, to the characters. Now the difference between, for example, it's like um, prologues are a kind of a sidestep. You're actually saying, by the way, or apropos something. And it's apropos the narrative. This is what's happening. Like an aperitif, again. Now with regard to starting it, with a dialogue or not dialogue. It's about the, you know, there are different writers do it differently. And I suppose, you know, it's like asking an author, when you get up at night at three o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom, do you put your left foot first or right foot first? Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. It's neither here nor there. It's irrelevant what, how you do it. What you do is, the characters have already been introduced, and so then you have already been told who Bella is, because in the rest of the prologue, he is trying to reach Bella. He is trying to do something with Bella, but he doesn't want to reach Bella. So that's, does that answer the question? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Good. Yes, please. You already walked in Indian view, so that kind of prompts this question. I noticed in your biography that you spent some time in India. Yes. In fact, my home city of Chandigarh is yes. in Yes. Perhaps we were together. I mean, you're younger than I am. Yes. <laughs> but I was curious, you know, actually, in the arc of your, your life's journey, you've been in places. How has that, has that stayed with you? Have you gone back to the, you know, how did that? Stayed with me, meaning? Stayed with you, stayed with you. Ah, yeah. Well, uh, I, at the age of 18, 19, 
I had the scholarship to come to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. It was all arranged. I was going to come and do journalism and literature. But soon after being given that scholarship, one day I'm a typist clerk doing some small little articles and that kind of thing. One day, a Sardar, a man, you know, with his respectable type of never cutting his hair type. And I spoke. And then he said to me, I understand you're going to America. And I said, well, I'm hesitating with it. To America. And he said, where would you like to go if you're not going to America? I said, I would actually prefer to go to India. Was it in Somalia, this conversation? Yes, in Somalia. And I'm 18 years of age. And then he said, are you serious? And I said, yes. He said, you're mad. <laughs> Everybody would want to go to America. I said, America will come later if I succeed in doing what I want to do. I want to become a writer. If I succeed, America will definitely come. But the likelihood of India coming is probably not there. He happened to be the cultural attaché of the Indian Embassy to Somalia. And then we talked some more. And then he said to me, let me think about it. He thought about it. The Indian government then offered me a scholarship. And then not only that, but he also suggested that I go to the university he went to because I was interested in Indian philosophy. I was interested in literature and philosophy, and therefore I thought I would learn more, I would become wiser. How stupid I was on the good <laughs> So I went to Chandigarh and enjoyed uh, my stay in India, and eventually, eventually, when I finish my first degree at Punjab University, Chandigarh, uh, I went back to Somalia and then got involved in theatre, and then again went to the uh, what you call it. I was in theatre, so you know, I got involved and then ran into trouble with the authorities because they wouldn't allow me to produce some of the plays that I wanted to do. And even when I was in India, I became involved uh, in family planning. I used, I used to write for family planning, uh, uh, radio station, all India radio. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have been good, but anyway, they, 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 and so, and I didn't go back until Maybe 20 years after. So you did go back? I did go back, and they have offered me actually an honorary doctorate at the university, but I haven't had, I haven't had the time to go and pick up, pick up the, the honor that's being given. Yeah. So that's the story. Yeah. My life has never gone straight. My life has always gone sidestepping the name. If you're running out of questions, I will read some more. Yes, please. <laughs> Can you tell us about Somalia at the time you know, when you grew up there and what it was like? Read the novel and you will find a lot more. <laughs> the novel looks back nostalgically on what Somalia was like when I was growing up. And when Bella, the principal character of the novel, was growing up. Mogadishu was a secular city. Mogadishu was a cosmopolitan city. Mogadishu is much older than New York. Mogadishu is much older than many European cities. In the 8th century, 9th century, Mogadishu was a cosmopolitan city where you could come from anywhere and live in the city and feel absolutely comfortable and at home. And bizarrely, for reasons to do with commerce, Somali was not the lingua franca in Mogadishu at that time, but Arabic. And the place Mogadishu, the name comes from Maqad Shah in, in the Arabic meaning, which is the headquarters of the Shah. 
maqam, the headquarters of the Shah, and therefore it was an extension of the, you know, at that time, of the Persian Empire overseas, and then it became the Ottoman Empire until the Europeans came and uh, took over, and because there was a you know, a small little gap between the time the Turkish Empire collapsed and, the, and you know, European countries becoming more and more interested in overtaking some of these places. And so what has died in Somalia, people usually talk about state structures collapsing and all this. My argument has often been the idea of cosmopolitanism has died. The idea of tolerance, of accepting other people coming from other places and making the city their own, is no longer there. Yes, sir. I, mean, I read something earlier, and I've seen it several times. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you talk a little bit about, I think you've got nothing back since the last time. I was, I was there two week, two, uh, eight weeks ago. Yes, I go back, I go back, and I'll explain why. You wouldn't read that in my books. Right. If you if you read my books, you wouldn't read them. And the reason is because, um, let me explain. <coughs> Could I ask what your name is, sir? Edward. Yeah. Edward what? K-Bag. K-Bag. K now, in Somali terms, k back would be your clan. And therefore, people whose ancestors are the same as yours, k back are relations of yours. Number one. Number two, what operates is an entire territory as big as <coughs> New York. That territory would belong to one, in inverted commas, clan family. Somalis are nomads. And because water is scarce, pasture is scarce. There have always been conflicts between groups. Unless there is agreement between groups saying, okay, you can, uh, we can share the pasture. This time, you have good pasture. Next time, when we have rains and you don't, we will share it. But when, in terms of representation, political representation. Some groups of people think that they have more right to run the show politically than others. And therefore there are conflicts. And I'll explain the conflicts. For example, somebody born and brought up in Chicago who has never set foot in New York, says, I want to come and become a Senate. Unless you are Hillary Clinton, obviously. Mm -hmm. I want to come and run in the Senate for New York. Do you think that the people of New Yorkers would allow that to happen? Not so easily, although with Coke Brothers money, anything's possible. Yeah. That in the normal course of affairs it wouldn't happen very easily. It wouldn't happen very easily. And so what happens very often in Somalia is that there are economic battles. There is very little in the way of resources, very little in the way of water, very little in the way of education, and there is continuous warring strife between groups of people over the small little thing that there is. But when there is plenty of rain, plenty of water, 
nobody belongs to any family. <coughs> family. So that's, that's what it is. Uh, and they continue changing, and the reason is because, you know, and, and then something else that quite often happens. If I am North American Indian and I applied for a job and I didn't get it, or if I were African American and I didn't get the job that I asked for, or if I were a man and I didn't get the job, I would always say, well, the reason why I didn't get this job is because I am, you know, this. So these definitions and self-definitions obviously play a big role in the revival of the interest in the clan business. But they have no political significance, really, if you if you go deep down into it. Yes, ma'am. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about literary freedom or lack of it in Somalia, particularly with your work? Well, uh, I mean, are you free to publish, tell your stories in a country that you know? Well, now I am. Oh. Now I am. But there was a time when I was about 29, when I, thought, when I was first sentenced to 30 years in prison for writing a very silly book. And I think it's a silly book when I look at it now. And then subsequently was sentenced to death in 1979. And so I couldn't go back to Somalia uh, until the man, the dictator, who sentenced me to death himself died, and then I could go back. Now, the difficulty is that I continue writing about three things. First of all, Somalis, many Somalis. I love them, but usually I love them in small quantities. Many Somalis began to look at me as as a person not to trust or respect, because my first novel was about the position of women in society, which obviously alienated them from me, because they said, you know, why are you telling the rest of the world in a language called, you know, in an English, the language is English, why are you telling the rest of the world that we practice female circumcision that we treat our women quite badly, that we are never kind to our children, that we are a cruel society. Why are you, you know, uh, jumping up and down and going up the minaret and speaking quite loudly about these matters? That obviously created a friction, direct friction, between me and my own brothers and sisters somewhere. And the reason is because it was my idea that, you know, you can't achieve progress, democracy, you can't go forward unless the entire, if there is harmony between the members of the family unit, a small family unit. Because when the small family unit is unhappy with one another, in the presence of one another, and there is a mini dictator, i.e. the head of this and that and the other one, you are going to have problems. Now I'm talking about 1969. Over the years, and because I have also written dictated trilogy, dictatorships of trilogy, and talking about society, and the cruelty of society and that we must mend it always, <coughs> we must be kind to you know, humans and everything else, that created that. So after the dictator was overthrown, eventually I was able to go, but only for a very short period of time. Why? Because now there are the so-called so terrorists about whom I have written books and articles and you know, spoken quite frankly and 
critically about them. And they have on their websites threats to say that they, if they can get me, they will. But I usually say I've written another book this time. I'll do another one next time until they get me. And that's the life, the kind of life that someone like me would live in. Because you have uh, many things uh, happen simultaneously in a place like Somalia where there are, a civil war has gone on for so long and then in addition to that there are so many different countries, Arabs mainly, America, Europe, that are continually interfering in the political affairs and dictating the terms uh, by which we should live. So it's not a very simple yes or no, but it's more yes and more no at the same time. Yes, ma'am. Are your books available in Somalia? Um, they would be available, but they're very expensive. Uh, consider a Kalashnikov is six dollars, and you need a Kalashnikov more than you need a hard bank book that's going to cost $27. But libraries, universities, schools? Um... Well, the civil war has obviously eaten away all this, all these liberties. People are isolated. You will, you will see, not only in Somalia, but many places in Africa, where people <coughs> live in isolated existences and so on and so on. <coughs> English. Was that a decision or was that... No, it wasn't a decision. It was the decision that was imposed on me. Because you see, Somalia is... It's the only country in the continent of Africa where a population of about 12, 15 million people, the only country in the entire continent, apart from North Africa where they speak Arabic, where everybody speaks the same language, <laughs> but we were divided into different colonial authorities. A part of it was Italian Somalia. I come from Italian Somalia. And then there was British Somaliland. Then there is French Somaliland. Then there is Ethiopian Somaliland. And there is Kenyan Somaliland. And the reason, generally speaking, is because Somalia, unfortunately for the country, <coughs> occupies a very strategic location. It's in the Horn of Africa. You can't move in the, you know, uh, the sea routes between India and South Africa, between Europe and the rest of the world, New Zealand and so on and so forth, uh, unless you occupy parts of Somalia. You see? <coughs> now, the language that was spoken was Somali, but it had no script, no orthography. So everybody spoke it, but nobody wrote it. <coughs> nobody wrote it down. So in 1965, when I first started writing my first novel, Somali had no script. So you can't write in a language with no script. English was a language and English is my fourth language because I learned three other languages before I learned English. And English became the language I chose. Although I did write in Italian, I also did write in Arabic. But I eventually became easier because I could get excellent typewriters and things that were working in English conveniently. Right, Bella, 
there is a lot of, you know, the first 20, 30 pages, there's a lot of mourning, grieving, crying, <coughs> because her brother has been killed. So I'm going to skip some of those. And then, Bella, the name Bella is not the only name because she has a Somali name as well as an Italian name. Isabella is the, is the... She is half Italian, half Somali. Her mother had an affair with an Italian colleague at the University in Somalia when, they were, when the mother was working there. Which is what I'm saying, it's an, you know, looking back at the time when you know, a Somali woman could have an affair with a <coughs> Now something that cannot happen because Somalia has turned into another Afghanistan. It can, but there's a price to it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, if there is a price, people avoid paying the price. I would avoid it if I could. Although one wouldn't mind having an affair with an Italian woman. <laughs> also. Bella can't sleep. She changes into a pair of pajamas, draws the curtains, turns out the lights, and gets under the covers. But sleep will not come. Her phone rings, but when she answers it, no one is there. When this happened several times, she clicks on the log of recent calls and finding the number to be local, copies it out of the, on the pad by the landline and then dials the same number. Bizarrely, there's a recording both in English and Swahili telling her that this number cannot be reached. She decides to go for a walk. Convincing herself that the fresh air will do her good. And that there is no point staying cooped up, fretting and moping in her curtained room in the hotel where she had arrived an hour earlier. She dresses again, this time in stylish jeans, as if intending to set herself apart from the large number of Somali women here in Nairobi who wear body tents. The body tents are the ones She has heard that lately, following terrorist threats linked to the terrorist group Shabab, the Kenyan authorities have been harassing anyone who looks Somali, especially in its flee, the district with the heaviest concentration of Somalis. She selects one of her favorite DSLR compact cameras to take along with the intention of capturing Nairobi by daylight. Going out of her room, she puts the do not disturb sign on the door. At the reception desk, she purchases Kenyan shillings with euros in case she needs to pay for coffee or something to eat in a cafe or a taxi on the way back. As she prepares to step out of the hotel, she hesitates for a moment, uncertain if it's wise to leave her expensive cameras because she's a you know, professional photographer. <coughs> and other equipment in her room. What the hell she thinks? Hasn't she already lost her most precious eye? Uh, even though the cameras are expensive, they can be replaced, she thinks. Not so, my one and only brother. What a pity she hasn't had a snowball's chance in hell to avenge him, sending every one of his murderers to the lowest place in Gehenna. Having stayed at this hotel on multiple occasions, Bella is rather familiar with the neighborhood. 
the city centre, she remembers, is at most 20 minutes walk. A compact neighbourhood not much bigger than the layout imposed on it in the late 1890s. When a railroad depot was built on Maasai owned land by the British. Photographs from the period show tents pitched and shacks hurriedly erected for the railway workers, who were mainly Indian. And from what she has read, confirmed <coughs> by what are and others who know the city well have told her, Nairobi has never enjoyed much stability. Right from the get-go, a concentration of British colonists occupied the best land and the Africans were pushed into the slums to live on shanties, knocked together out of sheets of zinc, earning no standing in the colonial scheme as the city became a hub for business and eventually international organizations. The instabilities which are replaced with an African neo-colonial city have continued till this day, making Nairobi one of the most violent cities in the continent. There is a greater agility to her stride now, as she waves away invitations from a couple of the taxi drivers parked inside the hotel grounds, and then walks past uniform security to the street. Once outside, she discovers that half of the street has been totally blocked off to vehicular and human traffic. Presently, she observes that this is because the Israeli embassy is directly opposite the gate of the hotel, a fact she had not Remembered. Keep into the open, uh, sorry, keep into the open half of the street. She takes care to avoid twisting her ankle or falling on account of the many potholes. <coughs> Essentially, the road widens and it is lined with red tiled timber framed villas on either side. I should remember. Then there is an incline that makes her huff and puff, exhausted and out of shape that she is. She has regrets that she didn't take a taxi. But she soldiers on, nonetheless, the camera is slung over her shoulder, knocking against her ribs, as if urging her on and on, the way joking spurs. The road is a lot longer than she remembers and she hopes she hasn't made a wrong turn. When it bends to the right, now in a steep incline, she comes upon a mass of unwashed commoners in dirty overalls, men with something scurrilous in their appearances who are gathered in huddles, smoke. They look to her like mechanics on their tea break. But the low way they speak and they look at her is worrying to her. Her heart misses a bit in fright and she is relieved when the men take no notice of her, hurrying past without incident. She reminds herself why she is in Nairobi this time and remembers the responsibility awaiting her because she has to look after her niece and nephew. When she spots a taxi, she flags him down and gets in. The driver asks her where she's going. She says, Kamati Street. Without a second thought, the price he names is far too high. But under the circumstances, she decides not to fuss about it. 
to get in, remembers, remembering that Kamati Street was named for a Kenyan warrior whose statue was unveiled there in 2007, the year she met her Kenyan lover, Nguru. She remembers with nostalgia the bar the two of them used to frequent close to Stanley Hotel. Near the city centre, the streets are too jammed for the taxi to proceed early, and she gets out. The sidewalks here are narrow and busy, and the shops fronting them appear to be Indian-run. Their customers, nearly all African. She knows that a forest of eyes is trained on her, following her every move taking in her jeans, her t-shirt, her upmarket sunglasses, her bum, her foreignness. She's used to Italian streets, she lives in Rome. She's used to Italian streets, throwing up troublesome wet blankets in the shape of man, wolf whistling as women pass. Here the local yokels ogle, their ceaseless staring, bespeaking their desires. No harm in that, she thinks. Only she wouldn't want to be in their company, alone in a room in a dark alley. But, as it, as it is daytime, the streets are full of people, and Bella allows her sense of mischief to get the better of her. She sees a man undressing her with his eyes. And she goes to him and she says, May I take a picture of you? <laughs> On condition we have a photo together, the man says. And as soon as the crowd gathers, the ogre poses. Others volunteer to be photographed with her too. As Bella passes the button, presses the button, sorry, now taking a photo of one person, now of a group, she rejoices in the charm of Africa, even as she knows that such a friendly crowd can just as quickly turn violent. Here one must be on one's guard at all times she thinks. When some of the men suggest that she lent them her camera for a minute or so, Bella extricated herself from the engulfing mob. But as she tries to move away, the ogre insists that she keep her word. She is reluctant to let anyone else handle her camera. She has to compromise. She suggests that someone else use the ogre's iPhone to take a photo of the two of them standing side by side. That way, he will have their picture together, she points out to him. And so the ogre, his right hand mulling her side, poses with her as if he were the happiest man ever. Finally, Bella decides enough is enough, as a number of other stragglers have gathered around her and are asking to have their photographs taken with her. Quitting the scene, as fast as she is able, she enters the shop to buy a local SIM card and 100 euros worth of airtime for the spare mobile phone that she brought along from Rome, where she resides. Another minute or so later, with a train of rolly gaggers all in pursuit of her, she hails another taxi, gets in and says, in the assured tone of a local, take me to the village market, please. Thank you very much.